on the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast, we're going to take a closer look at the field of Geographic Information Systems, or GIS, and joining us is an exciting guest who has written the definitive book on the subject. But before we introduce our guest, let me first introduce my colleague located in Orlando, Florida, Matt Chester, Community Manager for Energy Central. Hello, Matt. Hi, Jason. I've been eager to record an episode with today's guest for a while, and as he's been prolific both on Energy Central and in the industry generally. So, so let's get to it. Absolutely. And here in New York City, I'm your host, Jason Price, of the Energy and Utility Practice of West Monroe and Community Ambassador for Energy Central. Matt, I think you will agree that we are lucky to have Bill Meehan as our guest. Bill is a very busy man, serving as Director of Electric Utility Solutions for ESRI and holding responsibility for driving their geographic technology use in the global electric utilities. Bill has been with ESRI for over 15 years and is a prolific writer in the field, which includes authoring the standard textbook on gas and electric utility GIS entitled Empowering Electric and Gas Utilities with GIS. His other books include Modeling Electric Distribution with GIS and GIS for Enhanced Utility Performance. On Energy Central, Bill has posted nearly 100 times and has accumulated over 100,000 views of his content. His profile on Energy Central says that Bill Meehan is known for his charismatic storytelling style and ability to make complex subjects easy to understand. I suppose we will be the judge of that. Matt, are you ready to meet Bill Meehan? I sure am. Let's bring Bill into the conversation. Fantastic. Bill Meehan, welcome to the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Matt. Look forward to it. Same here. Bill, set the stage for us on ESRI and GIS. Tell us about it. Well, well, you know, ESRI has been around for uh, nearly 50 years, if not 50 years, and they were, I would say, the founders of this notion of GIS. And Geo, GIS, of course, stands for Geographic Information System. And even though you think of GIS as a mapping system, it really is a uh, a business intelligence, almost informational system. We like to think of it as a geospatial informational technology ge- uh, infrastructure. So it's not just about making maps. It's about what I like to say. It's about discovery, discovering something perhaps you would never have known before. And, of course, in the electric utility business, we've been doing this, oh, it's probably over, I would say, almost 20 years uh, servicing the electric utility and all other utilities for, for many, many years. Let's talk about Energy Central. You recently published an article on the website. The article is titled, Asset Management Starts with Great Data. In it, you talk about Paul. Who is Paul, and what is he doing that is not to your liking? So Paul works for the, for the power company, and he, he's, he's been around for a long time, and his job title is a troubleshooter. Now, we used to call them troublemen, but of course now they're called troubleshooters. So what a troubleshooter does is it he sort of hangs out in his truck, or her truck, if it's a troubleshooter woman, and, and waits for something bad to happen, you know, like a, a tree falling on a wire or or uh, somebody crashing into a pole or you know something bad where it causes a power failure and people call in hey their power is out so they dispatch the dispatcher the people in the office that get all these calls they'll they'll dispatch uh, Paul to a location where the problem is and and he'll either try to fix it or if he can't fix it he'll sort of estimate what it takes to fix and then they'll bring in crews so they're on 24 hours a day so when I was working for the power, I worked for the power company uh, years ago. I worked for their uh, for the power company almost 20 years, and uh, I used to like to um, to go around with the troubleshooters just to kind of see what was going on, see what's going on. I was the VP of Vice President of Electric Operations at the time, so um, and Paul liked that. Now you know some of the crews like to have the utility executives kind of be with them, figure out, and they they, they could kind of talk what was going on. So one day I was with Paul in, in the trouble truck, which is like a bucket truck, and we were driving around, and Paul stopped. He saw something that he didn't like. He looked up on, on a pole, and he saw maybe a switch or something where maybe the handle was bent or, you know, something. So he, he was concerned about it. But then he looked over at me. So I'm there in the truck, and, of course, I had a lot of history with GIS and mapping. I, I was one of the early adopters of GIS back in the, in the days, back years ago at the power company. And then he sort of said, oh, Bill, I'm, 
Yeah, I'm going to do something that you're not going to like, especially since you kind of founded the GIS at our power company. So we went under the sea. He, he, he kind of leaned over and grabbed a bunch of maps. These were <laughs> these were kind of ancient maps. It looked like that had you know maps of the electrical system, all with neat kind of red markings. And I said to Paul, "What is that?" And he said, "Well, it's it's you know it's it's the the maps that I've been I keep them in my truck." I said, "Well, why don't you use the GIS? Or, or, you know, use the up to date maps." He said, "Well, I don't trust them." You know, they don't have all of the data, and I and I've been looking, I've been working in this area for years, and I know everything about the the the, the system. So he would make his very neat little notes. So I was really well, but but you know, you, you have all these maps, and no one else knows what's going on. You got to give this over to the mapping group, to the GIS group. Uh, I don't trust. I'm not going to give up giving them up. So what I discovered was that Paul wasn't the only one who would do this. Each kind of troubleshooter had their own set of their own personalized maps for all their notes but the problem is this was kind of the ultimate in silos you know Paul was doing his own work he was doing a great job he was trying to do a great job but what would happen if somebody else if, or if he saw a problem and somebody else didn't see it they would miss it and so it was really kind of very very inefficient so what Paul did that I didn't like was he was keeping his own set of maps. And when I discovered that this wasn't just unique to Paul in our power company, but it was kind of universal, not just in the United States, but all over the, all over the world, I would find out these, these same things, these same, these same kind of behaviors. So that's what Paul did, and I didn't like it. I love it. <laughs> it's now 2020. Do Paul still exist? I mean, I would expect that utilities are all caught up by now, and bought into the importance and necessity of GIS. Is this not the case? Well, I think it's it's partially the case. And so you, you would think, oh, this is this is 2020. Nobody uses paper maps anymore. And certainly no one uses red marking pens, you know, to, to mark up maps. But that's not quite true. Sure, they've been using GIS. I mean, utilities have been using GIS for years. But they still think of GIS kind of as a way of automating the making of those old paper maps. Remember, those things were made years ago, and they've updated them over the years. But the, the legacy of existing work processes, the legacy of paper, is still very strong. And you'd be surprised that people still use they use uh, paper, and, and even if they don't use paper, there's another kind of interesting thing. They create digital files that look exactly like the old paper maps. So they're kind of replication of the paper maps. And today, GIS, is, as I told you earlier, is an information system that is about discovery, not just about documenting what is kind of what everybody kind of knows. And the problem with this idea of replicating paper maps is that it's hard to get that information to everybody and to, to really use it for analytics, not just for documentation. So in a way, I think paper has built silos. I know those silos of, of work, uh, of organization, and even in many cases of automation of those kinds of silos. And the utility industry is, you know, over 100 years old, maybe 125, 130 years old. And those work practices have been around for a long time. And it's really hard to change people's behavior. All right, so we have a digital file. But if it's a digital file of an old paper map, it really doesn't provide the kind of added value that today's modern GISs really have about what we like to say is discovery or see what other people can't see or see what others can't see or really even about understanding kind of the nature of what's going on. So, for example, if a, if a troubleshooter is out there looking at, you know, a bad switch, that may be symptomatic of a bigger problem. You know, maybe it's uh, maybe there's some weather issues or maybe there's some, you know, salt contamination or, or you know, maybe some even people, uh, we've even found people that, you know, like to take pot shots at, uh, at equipment up on, on the poles. And so you never know what's going on. It could be, it could be uh, animals that have been eaten away at some of the bushings. So you never, you never really understand the full uh, holistic aspect of what's going on in the system. So... I think it still exists. Paul still are around. People, you know, are, are, um, are used to doing things the same old way. Uh, there's a, there's another guy that um, 
that I used to work with, and his name was Stanley. And now Stanley was not uh, a troubleshooter. He was the manager of the whole system. And he was he was an old guy, and he knew every piece of the system, and he knew where every, you know, good pole, bad pole, he knew all this sort of stuff. And he kept bugging me one day. He would say, Bill, we got to replace this pole. Every time he, would drove, he drove back and forth to work, and he would see this leaning pole. By the way, I did a blog on Stanley's leaning pole. And he kept bugging me about it, and I was his boss. And I said, all right, finally, fine, Stanley, go replace that stupid leaning pole, in which he did. He was so happy one day he came in, I, I, we replaced that pole. But what happened is the engineering department had also had a work order to increase the, the, the height of the pole. So he put a brand-new short pole, and then what? Two months later, we had to replace that pole with, with a, uh, a taller one. So the idea was that Stanley and Paul kind of kept their own little private world about the data and they didn't communicate or collaborate that data with other people other departments the engineering department or the the operations department they they really kept their own copies of everything whether whether they kept it on paper or whether they kept it in their head so silos are are a big problem and people still use GIS in many ways in an old fashioned way yeah so there are still Pauls around there and Stanleys but then the problem is when Stanley retires or when Paul retires, they take all that knowledge with them, and they haven't shared some of that knowledge uh, in the form of a, of a kind of a collaboration system like GIS should be and can be. Yeah, and, and Bill, that kind of leads into a follow-up question I had is, you know, you, you mentioned part of the, the problem is people wanting to do things the way they've always been doing it, and I think in, in a lot of ways you, you frequently hear about the, the aging workforce in utilities and, and the recent efforts to bring in kind of young blood and new people and recent graduates. Are, are you seeing any difference with how perhaps younger and more technologically minded uh, utility workers might treat GIS versus these people who perhaps want to do things the way they've always done them? Oh, absolutely, and I, and I think that's, that's the good news. The good news is that some of the younger workers that are coming in, like some of the millennials, they, they think of GIS as just, you know, kind of another technology that, that they've been used to using. The problem is, as, as the, the subject of my earlier blog was, that you need great data, and a lot of that data still lives in people's heads. And so when, when I think about a GIS kind of the older GIS, the, the sort of documentation GIS, and the, the new GIS, um, I think of GIS and the new GIS is sort of like a, um, a social media. It, it behaves as social media so that when you make a change in your GIS on your laptop or on your, on your mobile device or on your tablet, everybody gets to see it at the exact same time, as opposed to Paul, who takes a red pen, circles something on a map, sticks it under a seat. Nobody else in the world gets to see it. Where today, you put the, the information on a, on a map in a GIS, and everybody gets to see it at almost and instantaneously. It's about immediacy. And I like to use kind of the, the three A's of GIS. It's access, awareness, and analytics. The ability to access information right away and no matter where you are no matter who you are you can get that information provided of course you have you have the proper credentials and awareness it's kind of like answering the question what's going on right now and if I have that kind of awareness I could bring in weather I could bring in all kinds of information and I can tell you what's going on right now in the electric system and probably the other one is this analytics not only about what's going on but maybe why it's going on and analyzing that problem so that we can now improve our electric and gas and water systems in ways that we probably could never have done before and that's what GIS really does it provides a platform for understanding and I think the young people will see that because they'll look at it well, it's just like you know what I've been using on my uh, you know on my mobile device. I would assume, Bill, that the proliferation of distributed energy resources and various resiliency assets being added to the grid only makes asset management more complex. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, no. I mean, I would I would say yeah. You you you're right right on there. Um, we would say that the the the, the backlog of Distribution energy, DER, as they call it, distribu distributed energy resources, you know, they're becoming so big now. I mean, you know, you look at some of the areas now, DERs are becoming uh, the, the largest source of generation, or they're being added to the system. 
And now we're seeing utilities are being backlogged. In other words, there's a lot of back, people are putting in applications for DERs. You can't just plug a DER in an electric system. You've got to go through the utility to make sure it's not going to mess things up. So they're seeing a backlog of those things. And we've got, and it, and it could cause uh, problems on the circuits. So the problem is to see the present, the short term future and the longer term of what the impact of these DERs are going to be. And so, because they don't operate kind of in a vacuum, the DERs have an impact on the asset management of other parts of the system, right? And so, being able to see what's going on, and, and in the past, the legacy GIS was just about documenting the assets as it exists today. But that's not enough. So, the DERs must be viewed in the larger context, how they react, you know, when the sun isn't shining. Or, and the sun isn't shining, and everybody is charging their electric cars. So what's going to happen now? So it's really not just about that one piece. It's about how the GIS shows the DERs existing in the, in the total part of the utility system. You know, we just developed a, a, a new, I think it was back in early in, 19, in 2019, a, a new network model that is built very much like social media, providing a true network capability to anybody on any device, so that now when you bring in a DER, you're going to be able to see exactly what its impact will be on the whole system. Not just the ones that are there now, but the ones that are going to be built or that are in the application queue, so to speak. And because we, we, we see this kind of immediacy of, of work being shown, the, the, what's, what's in the queue, what's, what's already been built, what's going to be built, we can now do an assessment. That's that analytics aspect, the access of where the DERs, the awareness of what's in there now, and the analytics of what's going to happen in the future. That's what, that's what GIS can do in relationship to, um, to DERs. And I say that that's going to crush, crush the silos of this sort of old-fashioned kind of work. Interesting. So what do you expect is the next big thing in GIS? Where, where is Esri's next move? Well, I think the next big thing for GIS has been around for a long time. And when I say that, it's been around for a long time, but it hasn't been used very much in utilities. And that's image, image processing or using imagery in ways that we haven't really thought about very much before. And you think of imagery, you know, people taking like, you know, satellite images or images with uh, with drones nowadays, or or that sort of stuff, or, or fixed wing aircraft. And yeah, they've used images before, but it's they've kind of used imagery as you know more like pictures, like well, we're going to see a, like, almost like a photograph of something. But we've done a lot of work over the years in imagery, and now we're seeing the use of imagery for being able to detect things. Like, for example, using imagery to detect the nature of vegetation, where maybe uh, natural fuels like grasses are growing that could cause fires, because we've seen a lot of issues with fires over the, over the last year or so. And by using imagery, you, uh, you can even see where the trees are going to be, are, are kind of being, uh, having drought issues or infestation of bark beetles, which will d directly impact the operations of a power company. You know, a line falls on, a, on, on the ground and, and there's a lot of fuel there or dead trees from bark beetles. You can use imagery to, to see that. Well, so we've been dealing with imagery for a, for a long time, but now with high-resolution imagery, we can see things that we couldn't see before. And one of the things that we've been using imagery for is kind of in the use of artificial intelligence. So given, given that uh, you can take a lot of pictures of, say, insulators that are cracked or broken or have some problems uh, by then uh, using high-resolution imagery over a long Long areas, we'll be able to using uh, to detect those uh, those images or those insulators that are broken by using artificial intelligence. So, so I think that's that's an area that we've been used that's been used a lot in the past. But there's been lots of advan advances in image processing uh, to uh, to help power companies in ways that they've never been done before. So, where's our next move? So, there are really three areas I think. And one is much more extensive use of 3D modeling and visualization. You know, what we think about GIS as, as maps. So I used to say, I, I would say to, uh, to audiences, what's the first word that comes to mind when you hear the word GIS? And I'll ask you that. What? Maps, right? Everybody thinks of GIS as a map. But really, uh, and, and of course, they've been traditionally 2D. What did you do with them? You folded maps. You printed them out and you folded them. But really, when you think about uh, the next wave of GIS, it's really going to be 3D GIS, if you will, because the world is, is certainly not flat. And then you think about, like, 
looking at underground wires and pipes, depth is critical. This new de- new technology that I talked about called the utility network incorporates 3D. So you're going to see more and more 3D. And we've made an arrangement. We've made a, a really great uh, relationship with Autodesk, which has been known for its 3D representation with things like uh, um, substations and power plants. So that's the first thing I think is 3D. The other one, I think, is indoor GIS. You know, we think of GIS as, as mapping the streets and, you know, outdoors and, and uh, uh, you know, the topography of the land and so forth. But uh, we're seeing more and more people going to be modeling indoors and using the kind of GIS, which is really based on this notion of intelligence and location intelligence. And, and so we'll see GIS in small spaces inside buildings. And like I say, uh, incorporated with the 3D substations and generating plants. And we haven't really seen much GIS used in substations generating, because we're going to see that. And I guess the third, the third area would be the extensive use of advanced technology, uh, such as AR, machine learning, AR being augmented reality and artificial intelligence, and, statistic- and advanced statistical analysis built into the technology. And I think all of those things, 3D representation, uh, AI and AR and machine learning and statistical analysis and indoors, uh, those things are all intended, I think, to break down those silos that have been built over the years in the electric utility industry that, frankly, Paul and Stanley and many of the other folks who have been around that business for years have kind of We'll, we'll see that go away, and, and we won't have that notion of, of silos, of individual silos and departmental silos. They'll all go away because GIS is now going to be widespread, and it's going to uh, really change everybody's workflow, I think. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about this going forward. Now, Bill, one uh, technology that I, I was almost expecting you to bring up, and I'm curious if you have any thoughts on, is how uh, GIS and the advancement of drones might come into play. Ah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I forgot to say that. So this notion of imagery that I talked about earlier that hasn't been really, uh, that has been used for a long time, and we're seeing that drones now are able to capture imagery at a much higher higher level of um, uh, resolution, for one thing, they can get a lot closer. When we think about looking at a drone for uh, collecting data about a transmission line, well, transmission lines are really high voltage, and you really can't get that close to them. But drones, we can get really close. And I think as we see more and more drones or more and more utilities using drones uh, and getting exceptions for the you know the line of sight because that's basically kind of what the limiting factor for drones is today you kind of have to have line of sight for the drones as we see that being that that kind of requirement being either exempted or loosened we're going to see drones really essentially take off and they're going to be capturing all this imagery and then with that and advanced image processing we're going to be, see some dramatic uh, digital transformation That was fantastic. Bill, I want to thank you for being on the Power Perspectives podcast. You can always reach Bill Meehan through the Energy Central platform, where he welcomes your questions and comments. I also want to thank our contributing partners of Energy Central, West Monroe. West Monroe works with the nation's largest utility-owned utilities in their telecommunication, grid modernization, and digital and workforce transformations. From defending a rate case to presenting a business case, West Monroe utilizes a multidisciplinary team that blends utility, operations, and technology expertise, covering topics like aging infrastructure, electric vehicles, AMI, MDM, and ADMS deployments and industry disruptors like DERs and cybersecurity. To ESRI, ESRI is an international supplier of geographic information, GIS software, Web GIS and geodatabase management applications. To Guidehouse, formerly Navigant, is a leading global provider of consulting services to the public and commercial markets with expertise in energy, sustainability, and infrastructure. And to SeaPower. At SeaPower, we help our customers make the decisions today that guide them across the bridge to energy's future. Where will your energy take you? For more information, visit SeaPower.com. Once again, I'm your host, Jason Price. Plug in and stay fully charged in the discussion by hopping into the community at energycentral.com. And see you next time at Energy Central's Power Perspectives podcast.